Our scripture reading this morning is from the fourth chapter of the letter of James, verses 13 through 17. This carries on with this thought in James from where we left off last week. That was kind of part one. This is kind of part two. We're going to be following along with some of the same thinking next Sunday as well. James wrote here in chapter 4, beginning verse 13, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we contemplate your word together this morning, open our understanding to receive what you have for us. And Father, we pray that it would take root and grow there. We pray that it would bear the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit that leads to eternal life as we not only hear, but then go out to do and to put into practice that which we have heard. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Picking up from where we left off last Lord's Day, we've seen that James already gave us in chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, a glimpse of what it looks like if people choose earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom instead of the wisdom that is from above. James wrote, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions, your desires, your pleasures are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, your desires, your pleasures. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So that's what it looks like. We saw last week, we are given a choice between several different paths which reflect essentially only two paths. The path of the wisdom that is from above, the gospel, the word, the will of the living God, and all of the others which reflect this earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom. And if we take the latter, then we end up in this situation where we are adulterous people. We have turned away from the groom as the bride of Christ. We've turned away from Christ and committed spiritual adultery. We have made ourselves the enemies of God. And if you really believe that God is, then what worse possible place to be than in a place where you are found to be fighting against God, where you are found to be an enemy of God. And so in verses 7 through 10, James admonished his readers to repent if this has been their frame of mind. And we need to be very clear that when the Bible talks about repentance, this is what it is talking about. The verses that we're about to look at here this morning are nothing more, nothing less than a biblical definition of repentance. So James begins, submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I know some have taken that second clause out of its context, away from the submit to God part, and have woven some sort of elaborate schemes of what it would look like to resist the devil. Fact is, these two things go together. Submit to God. That is how you resist the devil. Know and put into practice the word of God. Be not just hearers of the word, be doers of the word, and in so doing you will resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that is the very change of mind and heart implicit in the biblical word repentance. It's not merely a change from one worldly way of thinking to another. It's a change from worldly wisdom, which ultimately, is demonic wisdom to God's wisdom. 
It is a change from being an enemy of God and a friend of the world to submission to God. It's the essence of the exhortation at the beginning of the very next verse where James wrote, draw near to God. We draw near to God by first asking for and then submitting to the wisdom that is from above. And since the inevitable result of drawing near to God is he will draw near to you, of course the devil is going to flee. Not because we're all that and a bag of chips, not because we have so much power and authority and we can lay hold of Satan and crush him, Not at all, but because when God draws near, Satan will flee. He cannot stand in the presence of God as one who has been thrown down and conquered by the blood of the Lamb and by the proclamation of the gospel, as we saw in our study of the book of Revelation some time ago. That's not to say he's not out there. Certainly our adversary is out there like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, and we need to resist him, standing firm in our faith. But we cannot stand against him in our own power. The only effective manner of resisting the devil is to draw near to God, and as God draws near to us, then Satan will flee. So how do you do that? How do you draw near to God? People have sought different means over the years. Some have climbed mountains to get closer to God. Some have made journeys to the Holy Land, things like that. James says it's really a lot simpler than that. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Look to your deeds and to the heart from which those deeds spring. And then be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. The ESV study Bible notes here that the laughter that James is exhorting against shows how casually his readers were treating their sin. Sin was just a laughable thing. But the only proper reaction to God's impending judgment is to be wretched and mourn and weep, as is seen so often in the Old Testament and also in the New A very similar lack of understanding is shown in our time when there are popular preachers out there, I won't name names, but I could, who have suggested in very public forums that metanoia, the biblical word for repentance, is found in a simple change of mind. One is on record as having said, when we preach a shift from negative thinking to positive thinking, that's metanoia, that's repentance. No, it is not. James wrote, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. They're saying exactly the opposite of that. They're saying, let your negative thinking, your mourning, your wretchedness, all of those things be turned to laughter. Just start thinking positively and everything's going to change and everything's going to be okay. But James says, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, and he will exalt you, forever ending the need to exalt yourself, to be a little God to yourself by imagining that the road to fulfillment, the road to being mature and complete, lacking in nothing, in James' words, or at least lacking in nothing, as a lot of people try to understand that these days, runs through being a god to yourself, which ultimately leads to bitter envy and selfish ambition. On the contrary, the road to fulfillment, to being mature and complete, lacking in nothing, Christ-likeness would be a better word. The road to Christ-likeness is through meekness, humility, submission to the wisdom and the will of God. Now, having established that, James continues to exhort those who would remain entrenched in the wisdom of this world. He says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Now, James is not saying 
that there is not wisdom in good planning. The double negative, that's horrible. James isn't saying don't, there it is again, don't plan. That's not the point. And certainly the point is not, and this will be very, very important when we come back to this same idea next week, James is absolutely not railing against the idea of conducting business in such a way as to make a profit. James is not a socialist. James is not saying, hey, if you make plans, you're ungodly, or if those plans might include actually prospering and, and, and making a profit. You're ungodly. He is not doing that. He's not railing against those ideas. Essentially, rather, he's saying, come now, you who make your plans, and do so in the words of poet William Ernest Henley. I quoted this last week. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. James' problem is not with the plan per se. James' problem was with the attitude of the people who were making those plans. It was with the attitude that assumes that we are the masters of our fate and the captains of our soul, and that having made a plan, we can then go out and we can implement that plan and we can make sure it has the outcome that we desire. If you ever needed a really good illustration of how that does not work, imagine those of us who had some really big plans for 2020. Had some pastor friends, you know, it was common. We didn't do it here, I'm glad. But some pastor friends who were going to do a big series, 2020 Vision. And some of them did it at the beginning of the year, and then, I don't know, somewhere about March. <laughs> Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go here and there and this is what we will do and this is how it will turn out because we are in charge. That's what James is getting at. And I know this because he goes on to document the problem in the very next verse, verse 14. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. You do not know what March 2020 will bring. I could show you the order of service and all of the things that were ready to go for Sunday morning, March 15th, I believe it was, 2020, that just were gone. James says, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. And note here that James does not strike at the plan. James doesn't say, all such planning is evil. All such desire to actually turn a profit is evil. He does not say, what are you trying to achieve, people? What are your real priorities here? He says, what is your life? In effect, I think James is saying, who do you think you are? Do you do you stand in the place of God? Do you control the rains and the seasons? Have you read that book in which every day appointed for you was written down before any one of them came to be, really? Who do you think you are? And if you're thinking, Pastor, that's not very gracious. God would never speak that way to his people, let me refer you, and you can go home and read this at home. Job chapters 38 to 41, for a comprehensive list of all the questions that you and I cannot answer. God was effectively saying to Job, who do you think you are? Who is this that hides counsel by words without knowledge? And Job falls to his knees and repents in dust and ashes, saying to God, who is it that hides counsel without knowledge? Well, it was me. I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. By the way, the whole point 
of the book of Job. And if you have never read it this way, go back and read the whole book. The whole point of everything that happened to Job throughout that tragic story was to bring Job to that point where he hit his knees in the dust and said, I have spoken things too wonderful for me, things that I did not know. As James wrote in chapter 1, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And steadfastness, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And then James would go on to use Job as an example of that for his readers. In chapter 5, verse 11, you have heard of the steadfastness of Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, which is the point of the book of Job, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now we're going to look into that a bit more in the coming weeks, but notice again, James does not just address our immediate plans. As if James was saying, you think you're going on a pleasure cruise, but um, you don't realize that there may be stormy weather or even a hurricane. Rather, he wrote, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live. Did you catch that? Not just if the Lord wills, we will do those things that we planned on doing, and we will receive those outcomes that we planned on receiving. If the Lord wills, we will live. This is more basic then just, you know, if God is willing, then, yeah, we'll get through, you know, the things that we've planned to do this day or this week or this month or this year. Not only can we not control the implementation and the outcome of the plans that we make in this life, we are not in control of whether or not we will live. Jesus said that, too, in Luke 12, 25 and 26. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? I love verse 26. If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, how small is that? Just add an hour. And you can't. And if you're not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? And his little brother James wrote, You do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. And therefore you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live. If we live, we plan to do this or that. And the text in James goes on to say, as it is, that is, when you don't say, if the Lord wills, we will live. When you don't say that, you boast in your arrogance all such boasting is evil. And of course, because we're not called to be the masters of our fate or the captains of our souls. We are called to submit to the one who is. We are called to submit to the one who is the master of our fate and the captain of our soul, because he created us, he chose us, he called us, and he saved us, not according to our plan and purpose, not just for our good, but rather he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. If God has saved you by his glorious grace, there are amazing benefits that flow to you because of that. Sometimes we sing a song, how vast the benefits divine that we in Christ possess. But ultimately, you weren't received, or you weren't saved to receive those benefits. You were saved to the praise of God's glorious grace. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God. That's why you were saved. To the praise of his glorious grace which, which, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So, or therefore, same word, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. According to James then, according to God's holy word, 
It's not okay to just say, well, we have that understanding in our minds that you know, everything is going to happen according to some master plan in the mind of God, so we'll just go on about our business. That's not okay. It's not okay to boast in your arrogance and to say, today or tomorrow we will go here and there and we will do this and that and we will conduct business and make a profit. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills and we live, we will do this and that and whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, to him it is sin. It's actually a sin to boast about tomorrow, to make plans that don't allow for the fact that ultimately God is in control of our lives. We belong to him, body and soul, in life and in death. It is a sin to imagine for a moment that we are the master of our fate and the captain of our souls. That's why we are exhorted to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But in the words of the famous detective, Columbo, just one more thing. Because we have a tendency to take these simple exhortations from God's word, and instead of taking them seriously, we make them simplistic. We take these exhortations from God's word and we shrink them down to a manageable size. Here's an example. In John chapter 16, verse 23, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Well, awesome. <laughs> Let's ignore the whole context of the Gospel of John and the whole context of the Bible and just say anything we ask from God in Jesus' name, he will give it to us. Of course, it does come in a particular context. We don't have time to dive deep into that this morning. I almost regret having brought it up. But suffice it to say that in my name, in Jesus' name, amen, was not given as a magic formula to be tacked on to the end of our prayers so that that guarantees God's going to do what we've asked him to do. So I noted last week or the week before, God, I'd, <laughs> please give me that Gulfstream 550. That would just make vacationing awesome. In Jesus' name, of course. That's not the point, even though it's been reduced to that by some, by some heretics, actually. It was given as a boundary around the sort of things for which we ought to pray. If you can't ask for it in Jesus' name, if the motive ultimately is to spend it upon your pleasures, your desires, then don't imagine it by saying in Jesus' name, it's suddenly going to sanctify that ungodliness and that covetousness. It was given as a boundary around the sort of things for which we ought to pray and also for the motive that ought to lie behind our prayers. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's the motive that ought to be there. And we're not to reduce it down to a mere formula and expect God to give us all that we have asked for just because we ask in Jesus' name. If we think that's how it works, we are missing the point, and we are likely to be terribly disappointed. Now, the thing is, we can do the same with that little DV that we put in the bulletin. We can put a little, and forgive me, it, it's just too good to waste. We can put a little the Lord Villing after every announcement in the bulletin. We can include it after every statement in our conversation. There are homespun versions of this. I lived down in Georgia and Alabama for quite a little while years and years ago. And down there they say, Lord Willing and the creek don't rise. Um, apparently that means something different than what we all thought it meant, but that's okay. We can say it and we ought to say it. James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord is willing and we live, we will do this and that. But in the end, for this to make any difference at all, we don't need to simply say it. We need to believe it. And we need to live it. And that's the point isn't it? 
We make our plans. And that's okay. But in the end, if we really trust that God is sovereign over all, that he rules all things in such a way that in fact all things come to us not by chance but from his fatherly hand, then we make our plans with the understanding that God's will is always, always what is best. Even if it's not what we had planned or what we were hoping for, looking for, dreaming of. God's will is always best. The eminent Scots poet, Robbie Burns, once wrote, and he didn't write it in quite these words, but this is how I can say it, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. But truly, the best laid plans are plans that are made with absolute trust in the gracious providence of our loving and Father in heaven and with the understanding that when our best laid plans go awry, it's not that anything is going awry, it's really only God at work within us to will and to do of his good pleasure. And if we believe it and understand it, then we can make our plans with that caveat. If the Lord wills, we will live. Planning to go pick up my much-missed wife in Manitoba and fetch her home. That's my plan. If the Lord wills, I will live, and I will do that. Someone has said that when we pray, God gives us what we would have asked for if we knew everything that he knows. That might have been John Piper. I'm not entirely sure. When we pray, we ask God for all kinds of things, but God in the end gives us what we would have asked him for if we knew everything that he knows. And I think that's also true with regard to our plans. Mice and men may scheme, as Robert Burns reminded us, we know what we want. And most of us are not shy about asking God for what we want, whether it's a bite of cheese or a luxury cruise or things that seem even far more godly than either of those. But as the, in the end, as God's people, we can express what we want, but we must say, if the Lord is willing... And we must pray as our Savior taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will, God's will, be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's look to him in prayer. Father, as your people, we ought to rejoice and find great comfort in the fact that we are not in charge of our own lives because we would just mess things up even worse than we could imagine. But you are our God, and our Savior Jesus Christ is Lord. And you are at work within us to will and to do according to your good pleasure. Help us then, in the power of your Holy Spirit and by your grace, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And as we go out into this world and we make our plans help us to do so, not just saying, but truly believing. If you, our Lord and our God, are willing, then we will live and we will do those things that we plan to do. And if you are not, then that would truly be the best laid plan because it would be your plan for us in Christ Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.